and say also that we will follow in this session. Um, you can put forward your questions all through the presentation by through the chat, okay? And, and, and the Professor Dingra will take care of them at the end and pass them to the concerned people, which are Mila or maybe Professor Dingra himself or the ambassador or whatever. So thanks very much and please do close all, the, all, the, all your video cameras. Thanks very much. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here today. <laughs> I am right now in Spain and take part of this webinar. Thanks to the wonders of technology. It's really happy to be here in this conversation on translation about the book Born to Die by Alonso Salazar. In Spanish, it's called No Nacimos para Semilla. I want to thank to start with the Embassy of Colombia because all the help given and, and especially in the person of His Excellency Ambassador Alvaro Sandoval. I will want also to, to, to thank um, Penguin Random House, South, South Asia Division in the person of his publishing executive, Mrs. Ishani Bhattacharya. And of course, the great um, um, scholar of this, of this conversation, which is Sharmila Bushan. She's a translator with 25 years of experience and also a translator and a conference interpreter, which we need a lot of that for our, our seminars to be able to be conducted both in English and in Spanish. And of and course, Professor Anil Dingra, he's the real force behind this event and also the brain. Thanks Anil again to collaborate with us. And of course, to close this round of, 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 of thanks, the team of the Instituto Cervantes, especially in the persons of Marti, Eloisa, and Pikash. What I want to say, first of all, is that it makes me incredible, incredibly happy every time a, a book written in Spanish is translated to a foreign language, especially if this language is English, uh, uh, such a, a huge language as English. And even more makes me happy if it is published by such great publishing house as Penguin Random House and in a huge publishing market like East India. Secondly, what I want to say is that this today is not strictly a book presentation. It is a conversation on translation. And translation is a capital instrument in understanding and appreciating other cultures. Translation, I would say, it's essential tool of cosmopolitism. And we live today in a multi-translational world where multiple translations between multiple languages are continuously going on in order to build a global human reality. So much then for the importance of translation in today's world. I want to thank again, Professor Dingra, He's a renowned Spanish with more than 30 years of experience in teaching Spanish and more than 13 published books. He has been program coordinator for multi ELE, which means European Master Program for Training of Spanish Language Teachers in International Context. And he's been also instrumental in promoting and implementing academic collaboration between GNU and the Universitat of Las Illas Baleares. I would like to draw your attention to his latest book, in collaboration with Gonzalo López Nadal called Indo-Spanish Cultural Encounters from 1965 to 2060, Impact and Visions, a joint venture between GNU and University of Illas Baleares to commemorate 60 years of the establishment oh, of wow. diplomatic relations between <laughs> Spain <laughs> <laughs> Please switch off the mic, otherwise it gets difficult to introduce. I would like to say that the book Born to Die reveals the world, reveals the world of criminal gangs of young people that have shaken Colombia. Also, we will find there the historical and cultural roots of a generation that interconnected with the drug trafficking phenomenon, creating a subculture with peculiar forms of religiosity profound languages, and a defiant attitude towards death. The author is Alonso Salazar, who became himself a mayor of Medellin a, a, a year later. I would like to say that the events or the action that takes place in the book took place 30 years ago. And because of the infamous cartel de Medellin, the city of Medellin got a reputation for violence and narco-trafficking. 
the majority of people today hardly know that, especially in the last two decades, the city administration has pursued policies that have been praised by international organizations as a model of local economic and social development. In 2012, Medellin was among the 200 cities around the world nominated for most innovative city of the year due to the great advancement in public transportation, especially with more than half a million visitors daily using its metro, train, and its metro cable system, a gondola lift system designed to reach some of the city's informal settlements on the steep hills. And it is considered to be the first urban cable propelled transit system in South America. In February 2013, Medellin was chosen the most innovative city in the world by the Urban Land Institute, thanks to his recent advance in politics, education, and social development. I have to say it aloud, and I think the ambassador will also comment on it, you know, because you should erase from your mind the image of the city of Medellin as a world center of narco narcotraffic, and allow some room to understand Medellin as a city that at the beginning of the 21st century has regained its industrial and social dynamism with the construction of the Medellin Metro Commuter with liberalized development policies and improved security and improved education. I had my own experience about Medellin in 2014 in Brussels. And since, since then, every time I think of Medellin, it's not Pablo Escobar that comes to my mind, but the image of an innovative city, which is a model for many cities, not only in Latin America, but in the world. It is for me also an immense pleasure to have with us today His Excellent Alvaro Sandoval, Ambassador of Colombia in New Delhi, who in spite of being young, it's a senior career diplomat with more than 30 years of experience. Among many positions that he has been posted as Ambassador of Colombia, Norway and Egypt, and he has been holding important positions as the permanent mission, at the permanent mission of Colombia before the United Nations in cities like New York and Geneva. He has been director of the Human Rights and International Humanitarian Law Department, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Colombia. But the interesting thing is that our ambassador is also a lawyer and a scholar. And so his interest in international law and his achievements in the academic field with two published books, several articles, and participation in many multinational conferences. Our ambassador, he could easily speak on the liberal thought in Colombia, on the principles of international humanitarian law, on Colombian institutional history, or in a topic closer to our book as Psychoactive Drugs and Violence. Ambassador, thanks for being here, for taking time off of your busy schedule. And we would love to invite you one again to speak on these subjects, but not as an ambassador, but as a scholar. His Excellency, Your Excellency, you have the floor, in this case, the virtual, the virtual floor. Please. Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Embassy of Colombia, I, I would like to thank uh, to Dr. Oscar Puyol, Director of the Cervantes Institute, uh, for sponsoring this event. Uh, Professor Anil Dingra, thank you for organizing this webinar on conversation on translation on the occasion of the publication of the book Born to Die, No Nacimos para Semilla, by the Colombian uh, writer Alonso Salazar, former mayor of Medellin, and translated into English by Madame Sharmila Rushan. And my special recognition to Madame Ishani Batashara, editor of Penguin Random House. I have a special link to Cervantes Institute. The Cervantes Institute is a very relevant institution from Spain, but for the world and for Latin Americans is uh, like the Vatican of the language. This is also the, the, uh, the space of our expressions and the very strong link that we express our affection to the Hispanic, Hispanic culture 
and also to uh, the Hispanic history and in general, the greatness of Spain and, and uh, its culture. Uh, I would like to start by saying that the book Born uh, to Die is an opportunity uh, to ask ourselves what the popular comments tell us about the world in which we live, paraphrasing the sociologist, sociologist Dennis Rogers. Therefore, it is essential to consider the roots and causes of the social problems that underlie the existence of popular commons and the dynamics of the urban violence. The stories contained in the book of some members of the popular commons of Medellin are an example of multiple marginalization, anomie, and serious barriers to social mobility. For instance, the stories of Azucena Montoya and Don Rafael, two inhabitants of those communes interviewed by the author of the book. Their lives had been marked by violence. Don Rafael witnessed the violence of the 1950s in Colombia, and he is an internal displaced person similarly as Susana Montoya's family. They are, they are part of a generation that went from pre-modernity to an imposed modernity with enormous deficiencies. The children of these families who founded slums have experienced modernity without opportunities and some of them organized youth gangs. On the other hand, there is a tendency to reduce the behaviors of members of youth gangs as simply pathological behaviors. However, the lack of educational and work opportunities are factors to promote the involvement in youth gangs. But as uh, Professor Catherine Beckley points out, and I quote, poverty itself is not what strips away a person's humanity and says then on the path to gun membership. Rather, it is constant marginalization, exclusion, blocked access to legal opportunities, to change the situation that truly dehumanizes. After reading the book more than two times, I presume that the peculiar language with which the gang members communicate and express their stories in the book Born to Die was a great challenge to the English language, language translator. But behind the language, Youth guns, identity themselves, the desire to achieve recognition, identity, and roots that they have not achieved in their families or in society. This language also expresses anxiety, insecurity, and is a call for help. Therefore, the state, institutions, society, the private sector, the school, the family, must inspire values with their example to young people, but must also provide effective opportunities of access to a school, health services, and employment opportunities, as well as effective entrepreneurship possibilities. In short, it is necessary to promote inclusive institutions and societies in order to avoid social and economic detachment. Uh, finally, I would like to underline that this uh, contrast 
in cities like Medellin. Medellin, as Dr. We all uh, pointed out, is a, a symbol of prosperity currently. It's an industrial city, it's a, a very representative urban uh, space uh, with a great success. Uh, and at the same time, Medellin is an example, as other cities in Colombia, that the way to overcome uh, difficult or challenging uh, situations that we confront particularly in the 90s as a consequence of the world problem of drug. That is not a problem just for Colombia. It's a world problem that's, uh, that implies um, shared responsibility. And that is a uh, responsibility that uh, the states as a whole uh, must confront with uh, very effective actions. In fact, and indeed, uh, Medellin as Colombia as a whole is an example that nevertheless that we confront uh, challenges and difficulties. The Colombian people has the capacity to overcome uh, the situation, to achieve goals and to build uh, a nation a nation with a very relevant uh, economic figures and very important social transformation. Uh, it is important to recall that Colombia is the second country in biodiversity in the world. It's a, a country with a very privileged place in South America and we need um, a, a very uh, remarkable uh, possibilities of, uh, of prosperity. We need also to introduce uh, social reforms, economic reforms, in order to improve the situation and to uh, achieve that the social injustice uh, was a, a, a situation of the past. And we, uh, we will uh, build a, a country with a prosperity for all, all, all uh, my fellow citizens. I uh, reiterate my gratitude and a special congratulations to Dr. Dingra and uh, obviously to Madame Sharmila Rusham for this uh, important work, uh, a very challenging work that is, I, I assume it was not easy uh, because uh, as I mentioned before, the peculiar language uh, that the book contains. Uh, thank you again, uh, again. and uh, uh, as the Embassy of Colombia is open to these events and other events in order to share experience like that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Your Excellency, for these interesting words, opening words, which you put already as in the key to the problem here. <laughs> I would like now to pass the floor to our moderator, Professor Anil Dingra. Anil? Thank you very much, uh, Oscar, uh, for your kind introduction and also for giving us uh, the prestigious platform of Cervantes Institute for discussing the nuances of translating a, a literary work from Colombia, No Nasimo Pa Semilla. A literary work basically written in the form of uh, testimonies uh, on violence, its uh, evolution, manifestation, and uh, consequences. And it has been written by the Colombian author Alonso Salazar. We are extremely grateful to His Excellency, the Ambassador of Colombia, Mr. Alvaro Sandoval, for your encouraging words and for also honoring us with your distinguished presence in this event. Uh, I would also like to thank Mr. Marti Basse and uh, Mr. Taman for facilitating this uh, virtual seminar. We are equally delighted to see uh, amongst us Ms. Ishani Bhattacharya, a publishing executive, senior publishing executive of uh, Random House uh, Southeast Asia and so many distinguished Hispanophiles, literature lovers, my academic colleagues, students and future translators. Most Indians 
uh, are normally aware of the great Garcia Marquez and uh, his famous literary creations available in English version in Indian markets. But it is for the first time that a lesser known writer from Colombia, Alonso Salazar's work has been translated by an Indian translator who is none other than Sharmila Bhushan, one of our former students of Jawaharlal Nehru University who successfully completed her MA in Spanish studies with distinction. She is a very well read, read person and has also traveled abroad for studies in Europe. And she has been taking great interest in translation as a, as a professional. And she has been associated with international NGOs in, and is, has been helping them uh, in translating their documents and uh, also has been doing simultaneous interpretation in conferences. I must also mention that uh, both of us have had the privilege of working in several high level international conferences organized by government of India, international organizations, UN bodies in India and abroad with uh, great success. It is indeed a proud moment for us to know that uh, it is for the first time that any literary work from Colombia has been translated into English by an Indian. And so we thought that it would be in the fitness of things for us Hispanic lovers and Hispanophiles to benefit from our experience of translating a book which is full of different varieties of Spanish language, ranging from the refined and cultured Spanish with poetic nuances, that is songs, to a variant full of local slangs and dialects such as Parlache and how this has been rendered into English to see if the translated version has been successful in eliciting the same kind of reaction in the reader as if that of the original. With your permission, Excellency and Dr. Oscar Pujol, I would, I would now like to proceed with our conversation with Sharmila Bhushan. Uh, Sharmila, although I have not read the entire translated version uh, nor the book because of its non-availability in Indian market, but thanks to some uh, online extracts of the book which you sent me, I could guess that it is not an easy job to translate it, such a work. So first of all, I would like to ask you, can you tell us about your journey as a translator and what is that that attracted you to literary translation? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dinga, for the kind introduction. At the outset, I uh, would like to express my deep gratitude to Instituto Cervantes and uh, Dr. Oscar Pujol for giving us this platform to have a conversation around the aspect of translation. His Excellency, uh, the Ambassador of Colombia, I cannot thank you enough for gracing this occasion with your presence and uh, for summing up so beautifully the background of the novel. Uh, Ishani Bhattacharya uh, of Peng from Penguin, thank you firstly for the uh, fantastic opportunity that you gave me to translate a novel from Spanish into English. Uh, being an Indian translator, it's indeed a great privilege for me and uh, thank you for also agreeing to participate in this. And last but not the least, I would like to thank Dr. Dhingra for being a wonderful mentor to me and for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Um, my journey as a translator, uh, uh, it's been about 25 years since I've been working freelance as a translator and an interpreter. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to work with a varied a uh, range of subjects and uh, uh, literary translation. I've not had that many opportunities, although there are a few I can mention. I have done a commentary uh, on the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I've translated it into Spanish. I have uh, also contributed as a translator to a publication called Seeds of Change, which has been uh, published by Navdanya, which is an organization that works on biodiversity. So there was a series of uh, texts from Latin America, stories and uh, texts which were translated. And uh, I have also been working a lot with uh, you know, women's uh, organizations, women's rights, sexual rights, reproductive rights. And in the course of my uh, you know, work with them, I've uh, translated several books, helped in editing, and also, of course, the odd uh, magazine article. Uh, 
for me this uh, is a dream come true because i think that the challenges that literary translation uh, poses are, are uh, you know incomparable and i think any translator would uh, uh, you know, love the opportunity to uh, translate a text and especially a text like this, which is so nuanced, which is so varied in terms of its styles and its uh, language. So, um, yes, as I said, again, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Penguin, for allowing me to translate such an important book. Thank you. Uh, can you give us a brief overview of the book, No Nasimos Pa Semilia? Uh, under which literary genre would you place this work? And can you also tell us something about its author? Yes. So uh, I think uh, the ambassador really gave us a very good background of uh, you know, the book. Uh, Alonso Salazar, as he mentioned, is a politician, a journalist, and he was also the mayor of Medellin from 2005 to, sorry, 2008 to 2011. And uh, the book was published first in 1990. It was a product into his research, uh, you know, into his forays into the barrios of Medellin, in order to research the phenomena of the rise of the youth gang culture in these uh, working class neighborhoods. It was um, translated uh, in, at that point of time by Colin Harding and Nick Kester. And uh, in 2018, uh, Penguin uh, Random House uh, republished uh, the novel with a few changes. And in 2019, March, uh, uh, Penguin Random House, Southeast Asia, uh, uh, released the English translation of the book uh, done by me. So uh, if we talk of the uh, genre, it's basically a work of nonfiction. But I would like to uh, comment uh, on uh, you know, the richness of the linguistic varieties that I use. So it uses uh, several uh, uh, you know, uh, several uh, features like uh, testimonials because uh, many accounts, there are many accounts, first person accounts by sicarios, milicianos, members of the guerrilla, or even family members of, uh, you know, the main protagonist. Uh, there is also a travelogue like uh, description which the narrator makes, that is Alonso Salazar makes in at the beginning of each chapter where he sets the context for you know, the story of each protagonist. Uh, it is a book which has seven chapters. Each chapter is dedicated to one protagonist, but it has multiple voices, as I mentioned. It has multiple, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, accounts by different uh, people. And then at the end of the, the last chapter, Alonso Salazar tries to give us uh, an analysis of this whole phenomena. He talks of the several factors that have contributed to the rise in violence, be they social, economic exclusion, or the history of La Violencia. If I may just uh, uh, mention briefly, uh, La Violencia, uh, as it is known in Colombia, was a period which is um, roughly dated to around the 50s when there was a war between the conservatives and liberals, but it is not restricted to just that decade of uh, you know, strife between the conservatives and liberals. It, it spread to the entire country in the form of extreme violence in the rural areas, which led to uh, the, you know, a lot of people being displaced. They moved to the cities and they moved to these barrios, which is then the setting of another form of violence, which is the violence of the youth gangs. So this is basically the uh, you know uh, background of the book, and uh, uh, I can elucidate later on the different okay. styles used. Mm. Uh, as regards its geographical and socio-political context, uh, is it only limited to Medellin, or it, it also covers other parts of uh, Colombia? Uh, no, so uh, the geographical context is definitely the barrios of uh, Medellin, but in uh, there are, for example, there's a Don Rafael, uh, you know, uh, there is an account, he, he talks about uh, his life and, you know, how in, when he was in the village, the kind of, uh, you know, violence processes that he underwent. So there are a lot of flashbacks, which of course refer to other areas, but essentially the whole, uh, the protagonists are all from Medellin, part of these youth gangs, uh, and of course members, family members. And also, for example, there is the voice of a priest, which uh, is, you know, the voice of someone who is trying to reform, who's trying to understand and, you know, uh, help the young uh, boys and girls 
uh, boys, sorry. So uh, I would just like to give a few statistics. Like in the 1980s, uh, there was literally a death epidemic raging through, uh, you know, the city. About 70% of the people who died were in the, between the age of 14 and 20. And that is what prompted Alonso Salazar to undertake this research, uh, you know, to try and okay. understand the phenomenon. Now, of course, I understand that uh, as His Excellency, the ambassador also, uh, has also pointed out that uh, the situation in Medellin has changed a lot. Now, it's a, I understand, Ambassador, that it is now a prosperous, flourishing town. Would you like to, Excellency, elaborate a little bit more on this for our of audience? Course. Of course, Professor uh, Dinga. In fact, as, as I pointed out, Medellin is currently a uh, uh, very relevant industrial hub in Colombia. Uh, it is uh, a city with a high level of uh, transportation development uh, and also a high level of um, education of uh, the citizens of Medellin. Uh, and in general, is uh, a city that uh, uh, overcame these uh, very traumatic process during the 19th in the last century. Uh, nevertheless, well, indeed, uh, there are uh, some factors that uh, is necessary to, in my view, to, uh, to improve uh, and the city is working on that. Uh, I have no authority to, to, to uh, to talk regarding the specific programs in Medellin, but according to the information that we have received, as and other cities in the in the country, uh, there are social programs in order to rehabilitate uh, the, the the people that uh, uh, have involved in uh, in gang bans uh, in, in in the in the young uh, uh, youth uh, gangs. Um, essentially, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to see in Medellin, like in cities like Bogotá, Barranquilla, and Cali, an important uh, development, especially in, in industry services. But obviously, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, uh, there is uh, a problem, a social problem, that we need to, uh, to uh, overcome, particularly the special emphasis in social programs, uh, opportunities for employment and social security uh, are, challenge, are challenges that we have to, to confront. Uh, the goals uh, are not difficult, particularly in these uh, situations of the of the pandemic in this pandemic time but uh, we are so optimistic uh, particularly according to our historical experience fact because colombia as uh, uh, madame charmila uh, invokes the violence of the 1950s for example was a very terrible period of uh, a, a confrontation between uh, politicians uh, between uh, parties, but we uh, we have a, a democratic society uh, with problems, obviously, but with the possibility to to improve and the growth of the Colombian economy uh, is a, an example of that. Uh, Colombia is a country with uh, 50 million inhabitants. Uh, we reduced the poverty in a very strong manner in the last 20 years. And also the state, the state of Colombia uh, uh, has the occasion to provide uh, many social and economic programs to the, particularly to the young people. But uh, uh, in my view, is important to uh, to realize the necessity to to be more active uh, in order to implement.
these kind of programs and social and economic reforms. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, before I proceed further, I, I now I'm remembering it was, it was my error. I remember that one of our colleagues, uh, dear colleagues, Dr. Mini Sani from Delhi University, she has also translated stories written by our earlier ambassador from Colombia, Mr. Juan Alfredo Pinto Saavedra, and the book was published by Saith Academy. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. So Sharmila is a second Indian translator who has translated some uh, Colombian uh, work. Now, coming back to the book, let's first talk about the title, No Nasimos Pa Semilia. It has been translated as Born to Die. Could you tell us why this title in English, Sharmila? Yes. Uh, so, No Nasimos Pa Semilia was, like I said, uh, published in uh, 1990. And the first translators gave it the name of Born to Die in Medellin. This title was given to me by Penguin. Uh, I was asked to retain the title as Born to Die. Uh, I would just like to explain a bit about No Nasimo Semilla. It's a saying in, uh, you know, Parlache, which is very typical of, uh, you know, the language uh, that is used in these gangs. And there are several interpretations of it. No Nasimo Spats means we were not born. Pa semilla. semilla means seed. So uh, in this case, semilla could mean that we were not born to, you know, leave our seed in the world as in procreate which is why born to die, then Semiya could also refer, in my opinion, to the rural, uh, you know, background of these people who were displaced. So we were not born to live in our lands, in our, you know, far, to do farming. We were displaced and now we are in a totally different environment. Semiya can um, also mean that, you know, Semiya seed represents the potential for growth, for evolution, because these children died so young, you know, by the time they were 20, they were dead. It, it's, it's also a take on that, that, you know, we never had the opportunity really to grow or to flower from, you okay. know, being the seed to grow into something else. So, but the title was, uh, you know, decided by uh, Ish Penguin. I don't know if Ishani would like to. Uh, Maybe we can, we can ask her later on. Okay. We can ask her later on. Let's first uh, go uh, with the translation. Now, yes. sp speaking specifically about the translation, can you talk about the linguistic varieties uh, that is standard Spanish versus the language of Medellin? Though I was not able to read the entire book, as I said earlier, but uh, I could get uh, some idea from the extracts which I read that uh, the author has used in abundance, no, this local slangs that is parlache, which is very, very common in, in the barrios of Medellin. And in addition, there are examples of, uh, you know, erudite and refined Spanish also, which is being used by the narrator uh, as also popular songs with poetic nuances. And uh, how did you handle these uh, expressions while translating them from Spanish to English? Uh, so as you have mentioned, there are different registers. There's Parlache, that's a language of the street. There is also, you know, erudite commentaries, uh, very descriptive passages by the narrator himself. There are references to literature. And there are also, you know, several uh, popular songs, which uh, were very popular among the, you know, these uh, young people. And uh, I would like to first just give a brief introduction to what Parlache is. Parlache is the language that was spoken in the streets of Medellin. And interestingly, before this research was done, there was no term, uh, the, uh, you know, there was, it was not called Parlache. There was no specific term for this language. In fact, the researchers had invited the, uh, you know, the boys to come up with a name and they came up with this name Parla Parlache, which is like a combination of Parlar and Parche. Parlar is to speak and Parchar is to hang out or to party. So it, kind of in a way reflects their ethos in uh, life. It's a, it's a, a very visual uh, and a very expressive language. And uh, an interesting uh, fact that I would like to put out is like uh, the researchers studied around 1300 words and they found that there were 73 words for death or things related to death. There were 53 insults. There were 42 words related to violence. There are like 19 synonyms for the police, which is a much, which was a much hated figure. And, uh, you know, and there's 17 words for prison. So it's a very um, rich kind of a language when it comes to, you know, 
aggression violence and you know the, these kind of uh, uh, aspects i would like to just share uh, my uh, screen because i have uh, you know would like to give you some examples of parlache and just show the difference for those who understand spanish or uh, from you know uh, uh, classical spanish so this is of course the book and uh, it's got a very interesting uh, cover i must say very beautiful and um, so this this is a chapter uh, the first chapter where which is called like i said there are seven chapters the first talks about this young sicario antonio who is on his deathbed and so there is a flashback he talks about his life his mother uh, doña susena talks about him so you know that's how uh, uh, alonso salazar builds and in, you know builds this character up so um, i would just like to read out if i may uh, the one of these passages and i've highlighted the words that are in parlache so it says a lunar por frentero por no arrugarse frente a nada también lo mataron rápido y se murió gozando estaba bailando ahí tres cuadras abajo y le empacaron tres tiros por la espalda andaba fresco por en sus lados no tenía liebres el pelado que le dio murió más rápido de lo que canta un gallo esa misma noche le montamos la cacería y se fue para la otra galaxia so these are words which are not you know typically used in um, you know in, uh, in in spanish i mean i had to look up a lot of words so luna was mad reckless and wouldn't back off for anything they got him soon too he died having fun there he was dancing four blocks below and they plucked three shots at him from behind he was relaxed because he didn't have any enemies in those parts the kid who offed him died before you could say cockadoodle do we hunted him down that same night and sent him off to another galaxy so if you notice i've used you know a slightly more modern language you know words like off because mm. these are slangs that are used in uh, you know english uh, um uh, you know gangster speaks and so th this is just an example of the richness of you know synonyms for example kill has so many different uh, um words uh, so i had to really get creative so i had to do you know use words like knock off off set to or stick a knife stab you know for drugs there is a lot of mention of drugs so uh, as you can see betray so betrayal there are there were it's very uh, rich in the number of words for betrayal mm -hmm. so betray snitch squeal rat sing double cross so i had to also be fairly creative because i wanted to give that sense of you know uh, a street talk and these were some expressions which i spent literally four or five days looking up and in this i was uh, very grateful to translators for uh, which uh, you know really helped me make sense of these uh, expressions for example apunta de convites it says this, these slopes became livable thanks to a tradition of collective effort now there is no literal translation for apunta de convites so i had to put a footnote and explain the whole uh, you can read you know that it's people get together and build a house for their neighbors and the everyone contributes with food and drink and uh, for example reparti trescientos mercados uh, if i translate it literally it really makes no sense because it says distribute around 300 you know gross staple groceries which makes no sense so i had to then give the whole explanation of you know uh they would stop by every once a while at the parish church with 300 odd bags filled with groceries to be distributed among people for free and then this uh, section is from a the description of the prison bella vista was uh, you know the uh, very uh, dreaded prison with dreaded by all these young boys because the conditions there were uh, terrible and uh, so they talk of the different kinds of punishments meted out to you know within the inmates within the prison and he talks of a tren de chancleta a good thrashing with slippers tren de palo so in these cases i just retained the spanish word because uh, you know had i translated it into a punishment with it, it wouldn't have uh, you know had the same flavor so so these are some of the parlache uh, uh, you know the language and then of course there is Uh, like i said very descriptive text uh, uh, antonio use uh, alonso salazar uh, pardon me uses uh, a fictionalized account of what he thinks that you know the protagonist might be thinking so in this case this is uh, this is what antonio is thinking just before his death as i said in the end he dies and uh, i will just read out uh, just small sections um es tremenda la ciudad por la noche mucha luz y mucha sombra 
uno es como una lucecita de esas, perdida en ese mar luminoso. Eso puede ser uno, una luz o tal vez una sombra. A la final, somos todo y nada. The city is beautiful at night, many lights and many shadows. You're one of these tiny lights lost in that luminous sea. You could be that light or maybe the shadow. In the end, we are everything and we are nothing. La ciudad por la noche es una pantalla tenaz, una cadena de imágenes que pasan a la lata. Mire los edificios del centro, píllelos bien. Son monstruos de cabeza puntuada. Se ven sus brazos enormes que se extienden y buscan locamente. Quieren atraparnos, pero estamos tan altos y tan lejanos como una nube. Estamos en estas alturas donde todo se mueve bajo nuestra mirada. Somos inalcanzables. Somos los reyes de este mundo. The city at night is a dark screen flashing a multitude of images. Look at those buildings in the center. Look carefully. They're pointy-headed monsters. You can see the enormous arms that are reaching out, seeking frantically. They want to get us, but we are so high and so far away. We are like a floating cloud. We are so high above, and we can see them moving way down below. We are out of their reach. We are kings of this world. In this, he's talking about how Antonio and the entire community visualizes the city as something alive that's, you know, eating them up. It was kind of, uh, and, and also the whole, uh, you know, uh, Alonso Salazar has used this whole um, trope of height because uh, the barrios were built on slopes. So they are above the main city and cut off from the city. So there is uh, this aspect also that has been brought out. And then there's a popular song, which is El Tren Lento by Julio Caramillo. So El Tren Lento va partiendo sobre los hilos de acero y en él se va despidiendo el amor que yo más quiero. Montañas y más montañas, cruza el tren como el viento, dejándome aquí en el alma una tristeza, un lamento. Ay, ya se va sobre los rieles con su vaivén, llevándose mi alegría a tierras lejanas, maldito tren. The slow train leaves on tracks of cold steel, whisking away forever, my one and only lover. It crosses many a mountain, it's gone with the wind, leaving my soul with an empty sadness, a lament. Ay, there she goes, rails clattering, whisking away my joy to faraway lands. That cursed dream. So, so, yes. Okay. So, uh, I will just stop sharing my screen. So, as I was yeah, saying, I, you can see that there were different, you know, <clears throat> registers, different voices. So, I, I find it very I, interesting that uh, apart from, you know, uh, translating, being faithful to the text, you have also mm -hmm. tried to capture the style which is extremely difficult when you are translating a work like this. So uh, do you think that uh, in the process of translation, you have also taken recourse to transcreation in order to communicate the same feeling to the reader? Uh, yes, definitely, because, uh, you know, in many of some of the examples that I showed and also throughout the text, I think uh, I could not... Uh, do a literal translation and also try to keep the language a bit um, modern in the sense, especially, you know, when you talk to the youth, dads, the young boys speaking. So I wanted it to be a language that is probably used in, today, right? And uh, so my effort was to capture the emotion. So in that, I might have also, you know, taken the liberty of, uh, you know, adding, uh, you know, words in some places or, you know, just okay. for me, the most important thing was uh, capturing the essence of what was being said, the emotion of what was being said. Mm -hmm. That was my main Interesting. objective. So how did you decide, Sharmila, <clears throat> on the appropriate language style and tone in the target language? And did you have to do any adaptation or modification in the target language, keeping in mind the requirements of target reader? Uh, yes, yeah, so as I was told, this was going to be a publication for Southeast Asia. And typically, if you look at gangster speak, let's say in America or in uh, the UK, which would be, uh, you know, something indecipherable to me too, well, if, although I'm an English speaker, I, I thought that that would not be the appropriate thing, because in, in any case, the idea was to retain the flavor of it as a Colombian novel. So the language that I used, especially when I talk of Parlache, of translating Parlache, was the language that, you know, the young, pe young people would use in today's world. So, uh, you know, in, in today's context. So that was one thing that I kept in mind. I also retained a lot of the uh, 
spanish words uh, and and you know so i used footnotes as opposed to a glossary because the author in his spanish novel has has a list of i think around 200 300 words the sorry i don't know uh, around 100 words maybe at the end of the novel which explain but i felt uh, and i uh, you know consulted the publisher for this that it was important to have footnotes right at that page for ease of reference and besides you know just the meaning of words i have also used footnotes in a lot of places to explain the cultural context to you know for example if there's reference to a song i would put a footnote saying that you know say kulio karamio was a popular uh, you know uh singer so i felt it was important to really explain the cultural context and i used footnotes a lot i did uh use adaptations in the sense especially when it came to swear words maybe i used some swear words where they were not required because i felt that typically you know if i would imagine a gangster speaking i don't think his language would be very pure <laughs> so so maybe i added more swear words than in the original text with i took that creative license and uh, yes yeah, so basically this was the most challenging part the parlache part was the most challenging the other texts of course had their challenges in terms of also you know being able to communicate the beauty of the text but for me i think the parlache was the uh, biggest uh, okay so uh, now i'll ask you a personal question what are your favorite uh, parts in the book in terms of translation and in um, case we still have time uh, dr oscar pujal uh, then i would ask her to read the, those passages uh, especially the, her favorite passages no for translation in case we have more time please do that anil okay well, yeah. okay so then Sharmila, i will... you can also tell us about your favorite parts yes. in terms of translation and if you could also read out so that we get an yes. idea of how yes. it feels uh, yes. in in english yeah uh, my favorite chapter was the chapter on the bayya vista prison uh, because it was uh, it was an eye opener i mean i i probably could read out some text from that but uh, it it just shook me up completely and it was so descriptive and so vivid so i urge everyone to read it just to get an idea of you know just what goes on in prisons and uh, uh i will share some texts which i thought you know which i enjoyed translating more than anything else um so just yeah so uh, this is the in the introduction uh um uh, alonso salazar quotes gonzalo arango arias who uh, wrote the lament for desquite which desquite was a liberal bandit in the time of la violencia who was notorious and who was known for his ruthlessness and here uh, i will just uh, maybe just read out the english text uh, here he's talking of the fact that that is the i feel for me that's a big take away from the book that you know there is no black and white there's no evil and good everybody is a product of their circumstances and there's always some good in in, in everyone and i think it's society and as a society it's our responsibility to you know bring out that in people so if you read the text you will understand what i'm saying it says i placed my bloody drawers in one of the eight holes that their bullets made in the bandit's body one of these bullets had killed a good man one who never really had the chance to be a good man the other seven had killed the murderer that he was i ask as i stand over his tomb pew not at the mountain side is there no way that columbia instead of killing her sons could make them worthy of living and if columbia has no answer to this question then i prophesy a tragedy the skite shall return to life and earth shall once again be overrun by rivers of blood tears and pain so he this the skite the this was you know uh, this text is from the time of la violencia where in some way gonzalo arango predicted this violence but i'm so happy that now that is all in the past and uh, i could also uh, you know i would like to just read out this uh, text it's it's uh, from the right of initiation so the paisa culture and the youth camp culture they are very rich on you know they have many rituals uh, you know their language also is something that is their identity and they have many rituals one is the ritual of initiation they have very interesting funeral uh, you know burial uh, rituals uh, they have a you know history of song and, and you know dance so i would like to read out this this is from the first chapter and this is from the right of initiation of antonio the sicario uh, a headless cat hangs by its bound paws silhouetted against a full moon 
Its blood has filled the bowl placed on the floor under it, the gush now having slowed to an intermittent flip-flop. Every drop falling into the pool of blood creates a wave of ripples that swell to form a stormy sea. Waves that pulsate to the rhythm of the heavy metal being blasted out at full volume. The head lies to one side, its luminous green eyes staring, seeing. There are 15 of them participating in this ritual. The city twinkles in the backdrop. Warm blood has been mixed with wine in a glass. The blood of a cat that scales walls, that lefty, deftly leaps from one plank to another, that walks stealthily over rich rooftops on cushioned paws, that slips easily into the shadows of the night. Feline blood that spurs you on to spring upon your prey safely and skillfully. Blood that awakens unknown energies and quickens the soul. So if you can Muy see bien. this... This is such a uh, powerful, uh, you know, description. And I, I mean, I, I could read out, if we have time, I could read out this other poem, but otherwise I would like to. Hand, okay. Uh, uh, thank you. you. Uh, there is a question by, before I proceed further, there is a question I see on the chat by Ms. Smita Sahai, who says, do you find any similarities between Medellin and Indian cities? Sharmila? Well, when I was, uh, you know, I ended up watching a lot of gangster movies and serials to kind of understand the whole culture. And, uh, you know, I uh, also find a lot of, uh, you know, similarities in like, I don't know if you've watched, I don't know if Netflix is a very right kind of a reference point, but um, the gangs of Vasepur, you know, the whole, uh, you know, the whole culture of, uh, you know, gangs. And it's, it's really, I mean, I found a lot of similarities in the way you know, I think it would be easier to translate Parlache into the language that they use because it's so rich in, you know, uh, uh, rich in invectives, for want of a better word. So. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I will seek your personal opinion. Do you think, uh, what is your opinion on uh, what do you think makes a good translation and what are the qualities of a good trans translator? I mean, this is for some of our students, you know, who want to be good translators in future, and they're interested in translating some works from Latin America or from Spain. Uh, well, I, for me, I think uh, when you talk of qualities of a good translator, I think an eye for detail is very, very important. You have to be, have the patience to review a document uh, at least five times before you send it off. Uh, in terms of literary translation, I think you have to be an empath because unless you understand people, understand the emotions, you know, that uh, behind any work, you will not be able to translate it. So it, it has to be somebody who is very empathetic. And of course, you have to have a very good command over you know, the language that you're translating into, because at the end of the day, uh, I think a successful translation is something that does not read like a translation, yet retains the flavor of, you know, the original text in some way, you know, by using borrowing words or, you know, using other techniques. So my advice would be, of course, to work to, to really hone your skills and any translation. I mean, in that I would say that, you know, it's not just that literary translation is you know, the king of all translations, okay. any translation is important. And yeah, that's true. It brings its own value. Uh, do you think students of Spanish language uh, who study Spanish and Latin American and Hispanic culture in Indian universities and otherwise should read such books as the one which you have translated to get a better and wider understanding of uh, Spanish language as used in different parts of the world? I think this kind of book would also be useful for any student, any course uh, of uh, translation studies in India? What is your opinion? Yes, Do you definitely. think this book should be prescribed? Because we know that uh, Garcia Marquez's famous work, Cien Años de Soledad, is a must, must in any course of Hispanic literature in Indian universities. But uh, do you think this kind of book written by Antonio Salazar can also be used as part of curriculum? to give them a better yes. idea of Spanish language, varieties of Spanish language, as well as uh, different uh, uh, socioeconomic aspects? Uh, definitely. Uh, you know, as a student also of uh, Spanish, uh, where I did study literature, for me, when I agreed to do this, trans I mean, I got the sample, it was like, you know, initially I had submitted my proposal and, uh, you know, they asked me to do a sample. I was like, what am I getting myself into? Because this is, a completely different 
uh, you know, challenge. And I think if uh, any aspiring student, one is of course to understand the whole background and the whole, uh, you know, social, cultural aspect. But just in terms of language, I think it's a very, very rich book, which offers you a lot of possibilities for, you know, honing your skills in different, uh, you know, uh, different registers, different styles. So I think it's a very important book and it would be great if it can be included. Okay, thank you, Sharmila. I think uh, you, so for much. the time being, this is enough. Now, I think we can also ask uh, Ishani Bharacharya you know, some questions or she could give us a talk on, I'm going to give you four or five questions. You could give your comments on them. No, For example, first is why did Penguin uh, SEA choose this title in particular? And why is it only available in Southeast Asia and not in India? Number two, how, was, how has the response been? Are you planning to bring it in India also, or only it is limited for Southeast Asia? And what are your plans for translated works uh, from Latin American subcontinent or Spain for Indian readers? Do you think there is a market in India and you could get more works translated for the benefit of Indians? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll go to those questions one by one. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for inviting me in this panel and be happy to I'm happy to listen and learn more about the whole process. So the first question that, sir, that you asked was, why did we choose to publish this book? So Penguin ICA was established in November 2018. So we are a very young, small company in the region. We're looking after 10 countries in the area, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Laos, Brunei, Thailand. And uh, we, we were being very selective and about what we wanted to bring to the readers. And translation has been one of the you know the strategy points for our growing list because we believe that we our, our motto for PRHSEA has been that we need to bring voices from the Southeast Asian region to the world, as well as voices from the world which haven't either been, uh, which are not say those popular stories or popular uh, names, but really good literature, which the readership of Southeast Asia might benefit from and would like. And uh, Bond and I, we decided to go with it firstly because of uh, the eminence of the first book, the book that was published in the 90s. And uh, the author himself, his uh, previous book on Pablo Escobar was popular in the region. He's a very well-known author. And as a good uh, book to have on our translated books list, Bontodai was that choice. And that's why we decided to publish it for the region. And the themes that it goes to, it has human interest stories in it. It has a collection of uh, various viewpoints, various experiences, giving us both the side of the victim as well as uh, victims in court, as well as the gangs in the region. And crime syndicates are not an unfamiliar concept even in Southeast Asian countries. Uh, drug traffic trafficking is not an unfamiliar concept in the, with the readers in Southeast Asia. And we believe that these concepts would merge very easily quickly and easily with the readers there. And it will also give them a view into how uh, Medellin was uh, 30 years or so ago and bring a culture, to it, bring a, a sympathy to the world outside of Southeast Asia. The second question that you asked me was, um, how has the response been? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, we published it this March, uh, just before the world went into a lockdown. Uh, but we have managed to get the books out to the various bookstores in, in main countries, as in Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, where most of the English readership exists. Uh, Singapore and Malaysia more, uh, is more English language friendly as readers. Indonesia and uh, Philippines would be the second best. And uh, we have had inquiries for reviews from uh, people, but just because of logistical issues during the, due to the national lockdowns, we are struggling with it. But it's an ongoing process. We are always behind our books. Our books don't become backlist for us. We always keep them as part of our you know, discussion points, as part of potential readers, and that will always be there. The third question that you asked us, asked me was, what are our plans for translated works from Latin American subcontinent? Yes. 
Yeah. Yes. Uh, we we are we are open to submissions. We are receiving. We are looking at other uh, publishing rights for the region for books to be translated or already translated from Spanish or other languages. Uh, we uh, you know we have published quite a few like translated books in in our short very small SEA list. Some of them being from Chinese, some being from Bahasa Indonesia, and. That's why uh, I would repeat myself in saying that translation has will always be part of our strategy for growing the list. So we are always welcome. We always welcome, you know, no submissions and proposals for other books. Shamila, you are welcome to submit another book to okay. translate with us. <laughs> Thank you. I, I see one question for you from uh, Ms. Smita Sahai. She wants to know, yeah. can you facilitate or can your publishing house facilitate some workshops on translation for students of Spanish language? We can definitely look into it, but uh, our, you know, our, our whole point or uh, Pink Random House is a trade publisher. We go after stories, we go after the themes, we go after the voice of the author more than anything else. And translation is we, we support institutions like you know Instituto Cervantes and all who okay. help get the voices to us. We are well, we are trying. We you know we reach out through small events. We reach out through webinars. We reach out through newsletters, showcasing what the list we have and what we would like our readers to read. And we also keep a track on what the world is reading anyway. Uh, you know, in especially in the pandemic, people are home. People are turning to content more, be it uh, visual content or the reading. And that is uh, an insight for us to understand how the world is changing and we can move with it. So we'd definitely be you know, happy to support uh, directly or indirectly the pursuit of translation good works. Okay, thank you so much. With this uh, conversation, I think it has been a privilege for me to have uh, this kind of discussion on translation with Sharmila Bhushan and Ishani Bhattacharya. Before I hand over the floor to our dear friend, Dr. Oscar Pujol, I would like to thank His Excellency, the Ambassador of Colombia for uh, gracing the occasion and encouraging us with his words. Uh, Sharmila Bhushan for doing this excellent translation and also en en enlightening our audience here about the nuances of translation and uh, Mr. Marty Basset, Basset and Mr. Tamang for facilitating this virtual meeting. And I would also like to thank uh, my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Minni Sahani from Delhi University, who has given us valuable inputs regarding literary translation. And she has also been uh, giving advice to the translator Sharmila Bhushan no, from time to time on various aspects of translation. Thank you very much. Oscar, tienes la palabra. Possible, please. Oh, thank you, Oscar. I'm so sorry for interrupting. Just to, we're uh, a very, very rich uh, uh, discussion regarding this uh, relevant book. Uh, I just uh, want to add uh, a very, uh, in my view, an important, uh, an important remark regarding the, the, uh, the language. It's just to recall that Colombia is one of the countries where high level uh, Spanish is traditionally spoken. And uh, this is important to underline in my view, because uh, this kind of language that uh, Mr. Alonso Salazar reflects in this book, that is essentially the expression of the a, a, a minority of some people, the people, the members of this uh, um, the, the, this uh, organizations, just is, is just the expression is like a code that they use in order to strengthen their links, in order to provide a, a, a manner to express their identity, but it's not the common language in, in Colombia. This is a very exceptional, very exceptional. Uh, uh, our common use of the language is uh, we try to uh, speak Spanish in a high level, a high uh, quality. It's a tradition in Colombia from the uh, 19th century. We respect the 
to use of the language. And is, uh, for example, Mr. Antonio Caro, one of the most notorious uh, uh, authors, philologos, philologos, and also linguistic uh, politician. Uh, they, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Antonio uh, Car, Miguel Antonio Caro, and uh, other uh, scholars provide us a very important uh, dictionary of the use of the language. And Colombia is uh, known by this uh, particular use of the language and particular uh, care in order to uh, speak in a very appropriate manner the language. I, I used to add this in order to recall uh, that this is a very exceptional, a very concentrated uh, group of persons that use this kind of code, but it's not the common language in our country. In fact, Colombia provides uh, services of translation, and also uh, we provide as a way of cooperation, the services of uh, Spanish uh, teachers in order to disseminate the knowledge of the, of the language. Uh, and it's uh, no exceptional in Colombia because I have the opportunity also to read a, a, a report from Catherine Buckley. Uh, the, the title is Guns, Delinquency, and Identity Formation in Los Angeles and Central America. And according to this report, uh, the, the author also uh, pointed out uh, this uh, future that the language as a code of minorities, of uh, members of a small organization. Uh, well, uh, I would like to, to underline this uh, very uh, remarkable aspect of the Colombian culture uh, in order to uh, also uh, reiterate our uh, willingness of cooperation in order to disseminate in the best way the, uh, the, the use of the language in a very high level. Uh, I renew my gratitude for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Puyol. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dingra. Uh, also, Lancer Mila Bouchan. And of course, uh, uh, my recognition to Madame uh, Batakaria. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks very much, Ambassador. Really a very important remark you make at the end. And I would just take it from there because as, as the Ambassador has said, um, and Colombia has a, a very high and refined Spanish use of the Spanish language, because if I am not wrong, we have some of the very first universities, universities in America were in, in, in Bogota, and we all know that, that has an excellency, and that all went through the language. It's not, it's not a, a, a casual, a, a, an effect of, of, of azar that we have writers like Garcia Marquez, which, which he raised the level of Spanish to, to a, new, a, a new dimension that are really, you know, recognized all over the world. And I take the opportunity to, to, to mention here, you already have done the Instituto Caro y Cuervo. I visited myself a few years back in, in, in Bogota, and I would like to, re, to, to remind you, um, 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 Your Excellency, that Instituto Caro Cuervo is one of our partners, Instituto Cervantes, in Madrid. And they have an office in Madrid in our building, and that we share many because Instituto Caro Cuervo is one of the great institutes for the Spanish language, as you have in many other countries in Spain, in, in Latin America, and it's a reference for the Spanish um, and language. This Instituto Caro Cuervo in Bogota. Thanks for mentioning that. I, I think it was very important. And just to finish my remarks, I should also take it from what Anil Dingra said and Ishani also, we will love, and I, I am saying this specifically to Sharmila, we could think about making a workshop on translation. I think, I, I think we could use your experience 
Sharmila, and and I invite you know all of you, Ishani and Anil, we can do that. But we can see, and and I'm saying it to Marty, who is the cultural manager, and he's listening here. Let's work on that. I think I think there will be few takers among our students, because one thing is the theory of translation. We all read the books. We know we know the manuals and the primers. But when you go, you know, into the practice and you have an editor like Ishani, you know, that is looking for a certain quality of English. Otherwise, the editorial will never, the publishing house will never publish that book if the English standard is not enough. So I really, really I, I am open to this, you know, and we perhaps some workshop of Spanish in, in, in practice, you know, in practical translation, how you go about it and how you can please such demanding houses as Penguin Random. Thanks very much to all of you. Thanks, Ambassador, for sharing with us this opportunity. Anil, um, um, you are a scholar, but you are one of um, a very good friend. We've been 30 years of collaboration with you even before the Cervantes. Thank, Thank you, Oscar. For providing Thank this you. Sharmila, you are here, the, the, the hard worker of this, you know. <laughs> Thanks for your work, it really has been very interesting. And Ishani, I hope um, to Thank have you. you again at the Cervantes, both in virtual Pleasure. form. And I hope soon we will be able to start doing some activities, you know, even in, in, in yeah, our... We do, our we do. We hope so too. In Delhi. I thank the you most so important much. people here, which are the audience, the people who make this really possible, because if nobody's listening, why will do that? Thanks very mm. much for being here. And I remind all of you that next week, at this very time, we are having the last conference of webinar on our series Semblanzas, Portraits, and the great author that we will bring to you is Maria Zambrano, the great okay. Spanish lady of, uh, philosophy, of philosophy, and it will be delivered by Marife Santiago Bolaños. Thanks very much, and I hope to see you again next week here at the same time. Hasta luego. Thank you. Hasta luego. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.